When driving down the Lincoln Highway, or Route 30 in Pennsylvania, you will come to a little village of Fort Loudoun. Many forts dotted the landscape of what is now South Central Pennsylvania today, but not many actually resulted in having a town named after the actual stockade. Just a short distance south of the town proper stood a fort that history kind of forgot about. Though despite falling below the historical radar, this fort held an importance to the colonial expansion west during the mid-1700s, in which it provided logistical duties beyond many of its neighboring structures. In its short existence, Fort Loudoun played an important part in colonial American history that is unknown to most. Though its most exciting may have been its role in what is now known as the Black Boy Rebellion in 1765, today we are going to cover its creation and its role in ending the French and Indian War. The year 1756 saw a great many attacks on the Pennsylvanian, Maryland, and Virginian frontiers as Indians raided and attacked the Conococheague settlement located in south central Pennsylvania today. In February, Tonola Way, which is modern day Hancock, Maryland, was attacked along with the Great Cove, which is modern day Fulton County, Pennsylvania, and the Little Cove, which is modern day western Franklin County, Pennsylvania. Many pioneer families were killed and captured. Fort McDowell, a private fort in the center of the provincial defense forces in the settlement, was attacked, but luckily held off the attacking Indian force. The Studebaker family was attacked, resulting in the father, mother, and the youngest child being murdered and the children taken into captivity. For more details on these stories and instances, see my uh, video series entitled The Eight Days of Hell. In April, Fort McCord was attacked and burnt to the ground. The occupants of the fort, Jean Larry, her five children, and many of her neighbors were carried into captivity. Her husband was shot and killed before her eyes, and his scalp dangled in front of her face. For more details on that incident, watch my videos on the attack on Fort McCord and the attack or the Battle of Sidling Hill. Brothers John and James McCullough, ages 8 and ages 5, were captured uh, just here in this uh, little ravine here on West Weaver Road. Um, not all that far from uh, what is now today Greencastle, Pennsylvania, and uh, they were captured by both Indian and French forces um, in July of 1756. And the reason why we're at this location is to talk about the instances that occurred on August the 27th, 1756, and they occurred where the Conagajig Creek empties into the Potomac River, which is now modern-day Williamsport, Maryland. And if you look uh, behind me here, this is the where the mouth of the, of the Conococheague Creek dumps into the Potomac River. And uh, here, somewhere in this vicinity, a band of Lenny Lenape warriors came upon a funeral procession where 39 bereaved family and friends there to mourn the death of a drowned young woman was murdered during the ceremonies. 39 individuals. So why am I recording at a sheet in Maryland? Well, first of all, gas is expensive here in uh, the area, and especially in Pennsylvania, and it's a lot cheaper in Maryland. So I'm down here getting gas. Second of all, this sheet happens to sit at the crossroads of the Williamsport Pike and Route 40, which is known as Hewitt's Crossroads today. 
Now, why is this historically significant? Well, Hewitt's Crossroads is actually um, the center point, or roughly around the center point, of what was known as the Salisbury Plain. And there were people that lived on the Salisbury Plain, and they were also attacked by Indians in 1756, around the same time as the uh, people at the funeral were in what is now Williamsport, Beth Williamsport, Maryland today. To counter the Indian attacks, Lieutenant Colonel John Armstrong of the Pennsylvania Provincial Forces organized a night raid under the cover of darkness onto the Lenny Lenape, or Delaware Indian village of Catanning on September the 8th, 1756. This is at the modern day town of Catanning, Pennsylvania, located just north of Pittsburgh along the Allegheny River in Armstrong County. Catanning was a staging area for these Indian raiding parties and home to Captain Jacobs and Shingus, two notorious Lenny Lenape war chiefs that were running these Indian raiding operations. Though the raid was a success by surprising the enemy, burning the village, and killing Captain Jacobs, Armstrong's attacking party was forced to retreat and drop a majority of their supplies as the Native American forces began to encircle them, resulting in many casualties to Armstrong's force. The Catanning raid failed to stop the Indian raiding parties from attacking the frontiers. In November, at the mouth of Path Valley near the modern day village of Fort Loudon, Pennsylvania, just up the road from where I'm standing now, as Samuel Perry had gone to tend a horse in a field when he was killed by native warriors. A party of soldiers pursued after the attackers and four of these men lost their lives in combat. In this attack, seven men, three women, and five children were killed. Two boys were reported missing at the time and thought to be, be taken captive or possibly killed and never found. Finally, after years of settlers requesting forts to be built for frontier protection and after turning many personal houses into makeshift forts for this protection that they needed, the Pennsylvania General Assembly, which was the government of Pennsylvania at the time, ordered in 1756 that a line of forts be created from eastern Pennsylvania to modern day Franklin County, Pennsylvania. The General Assembly finally realized the importance of defending the frontier from French and Indian forces as the French and Indian War accelerated. The current Pennsylvania Provincial Fort at Fort McDowell, which is not that far from here, just downstream, the, down the Conicajig Creek from my location here at Fort, Fort Loudoun, and Fort McDowell was actually deemed to not be suitable to the British forces who oversaw these frontier forts. Uh, and they oversaw them for the defense of British interests in the colony. So they suggested that a new location should be sought. So Colonel John Armstrong was tasked with finding a new site for the new fort in the Lower Cumberland Valley in the Conicajig settlement to replace Fort McDowell. First, the Winnebar farm was suggested, but Armstrong felt that the soil was too hard and the spot was overlooked by an adjoining hill. His chosen spot was what he said in the neighborhood near Parnell's Knob, which is right behind me, right here. That's Parnell's Knob. And it'd be where one Patton lived. And he says that the spot, I hope, will be very agreeable. This spot was advantageous since it was close to Bird's Road, which is actually not that far in that direction right there. And Bird's Road was the road that was built west in Pennsylvania to help the attack on Fort Duquesne during the Braddock Campaign in 1755. If you want more information on the Braddock Campaign and eventually Braddock's defeat at the Battle of Monongahela, consult my video on the capture of James Smith in the beginning of the French and Indian War. Now this chosen spot that uh, Armstrong chose was the Matthew Patton farm, where Mr. Matthew Patton just built a brand new house right down over the hill from where I'm standing at on the other side of that stockade would be where his house would have sat. And that brand new house was actually built to replace one that was burnt by the Indians 
in previous attacks. Colonel Armstrong and his men confiscated the farm and the house of Matthew Patton and began constructing a fort around it in November of 1756, right here at this location. Because the fort was being built in haste during the winter, Armstrong did not follow the proper English plans on how to build a fort, but raised a stockade that was strong and practical. It contained shooting platforms, buildings such as barracks, and a guardhouse, along with Patton's new house that he built. And if you see, there's uh, a few buildings in this uh, structure right now that's being recreated. And, uh, Unfortunately, I don't think I can get into them today, but it would be really cool if I could show them to you. Um, the fort was 20, 127 feet by 127 foot square. The shooting platforms were supported from below by posts, as you can see in this uh, recreation right here. Okay. Now, this was an uncommon design with these posts uh, supporting the shooting platforms. The fort's design was not impressive to Reverend Thomas Barton, who was a chaplain in General Forbes', General Forbes Army. While visiting in 1758, Barton described Fort Loudon as a poor piece of work, irregularly built, and badly situated at the bottom of a hill, subject to damps and noxious vapors. It has something like bastions supported by props, which, if the enemy should cut away, down tumbles, men and all. And if you see, his argument is actually pretty sound, because if you could hack them down the whole corner of the fort falls, and then you could probably uh, find your way into the fort if you really wanted to. Now, by December the 22nd, Armstrong transferred all the supplies stored at Fort McDowell, not that far from here, to this new fort, as heavy snows actually slowed the stockade work. Now, remember, they're building this in the wintertime, which you usually try not to build things like this in the wintertime because it, the ground freezes. By January 1757, the fort was completed, and at the beginning of 1757, the provincial forces at Private Fort Steele near Mercersburg, Pennsylvania today began to occupy Fort Loudoun. In April of 1757, it was ordered that only four forts in the area would be garrisoned by soldiers. Fort Lothal in Carlisle, Fort Morris in Shippensburg, Fort Loudoun, and Fort Littleton that's sitting in the Great Cove. Despite the want to name the fort after local leaders by the settlers, Pennsylvania Governor Denny insisted that the new fort be named after John Campbell, who was the fourth Earl of Loudoun and who was the commander in chief of British forces in North America at that time. There are two other forts in America at that time named in honor of Loudoun, one in Winchester, Virginia, which had a commanding officer named George Washington, and one in the modern day Tennessee. Now, if you want information on the, modern, the, the one in uh, Tennessee, um, see my video entitled Fort Loudoun, Tennessee for more details on that Fort Loudoun. For a short time, it was thought that the fort was working as a deterrent for the Indians so they would not attack the settlement, but that was soon proven wrong. The Indian attacks continued in March of 1757. In June, word reached Fort Loudoun that Lenny Lenape and Shawnee native forces moved into the Great Cove and the Little Cove once again. Lieutenant Holliday, Fort Loudoun's first commanding officer, led 75 men into the Great Cove to confront this Indian force. Upon discovering the body of a Mr. David McGlellan near his home, Holliday and 14 men entered the house. The rest of the men were left at a nearby spring. The men were soon surrounded by the Indian force, and Holliday and most of his men were killed in the melee. The remainder of the force made its way back to safety here at Fort Loudoun. Colonel John Armstrong, commanding the provincial forces in this area, ordered guards to be given to farmers while they harvested their crops. Yet still, a few of these were attacked anyway. All in all, 
the year 1757 saw over 200 men, women, and children killed, wounded, and captured in this settlement. From June 14th to June 16th, 1758, Fort Loudoun was a meeting place for talks with 200 warriors of the Cherokee and Catawaba Indian nations, in which the British tried to convince these southern Indian nations to ally with the British and join them to assault the French stronghold of Fort Duquesne. Colonel Henry Bouquet, who led these negotiations, wrote from Fort Loudoun to his superior, General John Forbes, that after two days of intrigue, dinners, and public councils, the Cherokees, who were determined to leave us, have changed their minds. And besides the 27 Catawabas, we have 99 Cherokees resolved to follow us everywhere you may want to lead us. I should like to be able to send you their replies to the speeches that I have made to them. I assure you, sir, that I was astonished to find so much spirit, imagination, strength, and dignity in the savages. Unfortunately, by mid-August, most of the Cherokee had decided to return home. These are most likely Cherokee associated with Fort Loudoun, Tennessee, as discussed in my video regarding that fort. In 1758, the British government, under the leadership of Prime Minister William Pitt, decided to take a more aggressive approach to the French occupation of the western part of the American colonies. It was decided to once again assault Fort Duquesne on the forks of the Ohio River that they failed to take during the Braddock Expedition in 1755. That assault resulted in General Braddock's death and a major defeat of British troops. For more information on Braddock's defeat in the Battle of Monongahela, please see my video in the beginning of the French and Indian War and of course uh, uh, the capture of James Smith. To assault Fort Duquesne, the British military combined the colonial militias with the British regular military. The Pennsylvania troops and British regulars were to assemble at Carlisle, Pennsylvania in October of 1758 and travel down Bird's Road, a road cut during the Braddock's expedition, past Fort Loudoun and west towards Bedford, Pennsylvania, and eventually to Fort Duquesne. They were 1,200 British regulars and 2,200 Pennsylvanians. The Pennsylvania troops were led by Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Shippen from the family that founded Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. The three battalions of his regiment were commanded by Colonel John Armstrong, who, as we talked about before, led the attack on the Indian village of Katanning a year before. The second battalion was uh, commanded by Colonel James Byrd, who was in charge of building Byrd's Road to join up with the doomed Braddock expedition in 1755. And then the third battalion was commanded by Colonel Hugh Mercer, a doctor turned soldier who was wounded at the Battle of Katanning. Uh, he traveled with the wagons during the Forbes expedition, and it was he who Mercersburg, Pennsylvania was named after. The Virginians, who were led by Colonel George Washington, the Marylanders, and the North Carolinians, joined this force at Bedford, Pennsylvania, along what was to be later called Forbes Road. And this was to create a fighting force of over 5,000 men to assault Fort Duquesne. On the way to assault Fort Duquesne, many of these famous people most likely stopped here at Fort Loudoun. Specifically, General Forbes, who was ill at the time and carried on a litter between two horses almost the entire campaign. And he most likely stayed in the bar house outside the fort. And as you can see over here, um, this was a, the, the bar house or the house it was kind of like a cottage outside of the fort and um, I don't believe there's conclusive evidence to prove that this was indeed that bar house but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence and they're working on right now uh, here at the fort um, in order to prove that and they're also fixing it up as well but uh, that would most likely be where General Forbes would have stayed if he, when, when he was here um, the other person that was definitely uh, here uh, during the, the Forbes campaign was Colonel Hugh Mercer because he was traveling with the wagons and the supplies and all the wagons and supplies stopped here 
at Fort Loudoun. The first assault on the Fort Duquesne was by a reconnaissance group of the 77th Regiment of Foot, or Montgomery's Scottish Highlanders, commanded by Major James Grant, consisting of 800 men strong. Rather than spy on the fort and report back, Grant decided to attack the fort, which was a big, big mistake. 270 soldiers were killed, 70 were wounded, and 100 were captured. Among the captured were Major James Grant himself and his 18-year-old relative, Charles Grant, who was a volunteer. Charles Grant would be held as a prisoner by the Wyandotte tribe until 1760, where he was released, re-enlisted in the army, promoted to lieutenant, and became commander of Fort Loud. By November, with the Forbes army approaching Fort Duquesne and uh, some of the Indians actually leaving the service of the French, the French and Indian forces that occupied the fort on the forks of the Ohio decided to abandon their post and flee. They burnt and blew up Fort Duquesne after they abandoned it so it would not fall into British hands. The British entered the ruined fort on November the 24th, 1758. Colonel John Armstrong rose the flag over the fallen fort. General Forbes, in very poor health, briefly visited the fallen fort to only return to Carlisle and then to Philadelphia to die March 11th, 1759, succumbing to his illness. Colonel Hugh Mercer was placed in charge of the fallen fort and to build a new one in its stead. This fort will be British and named Fort Pitt in honor of the Prime Minister of Britain at the time. It would have stood in what is now the center of the city of Pittsburgh today. This military operation is where George Washington and Hugh Mercer met kindling a friendship that resulted in Mercer becoming Washington's right-hand man during the opening parts of the American Revolution. As the duo worked together on operations like the crossing of the Delaware and the Battle of Trenton and Princeton. With the center of French influence in Pennsylvania captured, Indian attacks in the Conquistadores settlement began to diminish in the years of 1759 and 1760. By 1760, the garrison at Fort Loudoun was reduced to a skeleton crew as the major function became maintaining their section of Forbes Road and helping to store and transport men, supplies, and communications west to Fort Pitt. In 1763, Indian military action started up anew with Pontiac's War, in which attacks on the frontier once again increased and activity grew here at Fort Loudoun. Fort Loudoun was strengthened by locals to combat these new Indian raids. In 1763 and 1764, Fort Loudoun became a stopping point for westward moving troops in expeditions into the Ohio by forces under the command of Colonel Henry Bouquet, who led the first successful major military engagement against hostile Indian forces at the Battle of Bushy Run. Bouquet was present at Fort Loudoun for a time. Fort Loudoun became a storehouse to support Bouquet's efforts, Fort Pitt, and British interests with the Indians in Ohio. These stores moving across the roads west of Fort Pitt will become the center of an issue that will lead to the fall of Fort Loudoun in 1765. During the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, Fort Loudoun became a major archaeological site for local and state archaeologists. It was these digs that uncovered the location of the fort, its buildings, and its history of its day-to-day -day operations. Now, thanks to the wonderful work of the Fort Loudoun Historical Society, a lovely recreation of what the fort would have looked like is being created 
right behind me and this is actually being worked on as we speak um, people have been coming here uh, have a group called the weekend warriors and they actually come in here and they do a lot of work building these buildings putting in windows uh, building the stuff on the inside of them They're right now working on the barracks it's just uh, a community effort and a group effort of all volunteers it's just a wonderful wonderful things to see but buildings are going up a stockade has been constructed future projects are in the works here as well in fact um, and I'm hoping to have this video out in time for this but on June 24th and through the 26th of 2022 if you're watching it this year uh, this video this year they're having a market fair um, at this location and uh, they have uh, mess of vendors. Yeah, I just talked to a fellow here today uh, 60 plus artisans uh, a raft of campers here um, They had like four to five thousand people visit last year They want to try to match that or make it better even more than that show up here and visit it's uh, uh, reenactors demonstrations it's a wonderful thing if if you are uh, listening to this video in 2022 please come out for this it's a wonderful thing um, and it's helped support this this organization as they try to support history in this wonderful historical place on this site is a beautiful recreation of the fort but also is the Patton house so if you look behind me here this building is the Patton House originally located inside the fort? This house was moved on the hill here to make room for the archaeological digs. This house was built by Matthew Patton sometime after he received his farm back from the military when Fort Loudon was abandoned in 1765. Now, the house serves as a museum and a gift shop to visitors of this site. Today, Fort Loudon is seeing its history rediscovered and reintroduced to its community and to the nation it helped create. Through its small existence in time, Fort Loudon became a pivotal, pivotal point in colonial America's effort to conquer the West. As many famous people visited here or had the name of Fort Loudon cross their very lips, Fort Loudon became lost in the broad sense of history. But what we are talking about today isn't where Fort Loudon's story stops. Even though Fort Loudon was locally influential during the French and Indian War, Fort Loudon would become world famous in 1765 as a center point in the feud that even King George of England himself will talk about to his council. Ben Franklin, a future founding father, and Thomas Gage, a British military chief and later general during the American Revolution, will all speak of Fort Loudoun as the sparks of fury against military overreach will kindle a flame in the hearts of the frontier people to rise against British forces in an all-out assault of this fort. This flame will turn into an inferno that convinces those frontier people to join in the rebellion against British tyranny that resulted in the creation of a new democratic government now known as the United States of America. I thank you for watching this video. I hope that you come out here if you're in the area, or even if you're not in the area, Come on out here and visit this wonderful site. Currently it's under construction, but uh, they have many opening houses, many opening days, especially the market fair coming up. Um, come out here, support this. Um, this has so much history involved with it, and we haven't even scratched the surface with this video. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I will see you next time. Thank you.